They're hiding in your closet, creeping around your rooms, eating pieces of you. You better watch out, because you don't know when they'll turn against you. In this video, we're going to look at how to make a machine suck, how hurricanes have been used to clean, and which is the best type of vacuum for your needs, as well as their history. Welcome to Thing Guide, the show where we learn the way things work. With a diet of dust, dirt and debris, vacuum cleaners are the tool of choice for cleaners around the world. They gather dirt together in bags or containers so it can be disposed of easily, and they've become essential to every homeowner. On the other hand, vacuums suck. But how do they do it? All gases, like the air around us, like to spread out and find their own space. They're not too different to us in this way. So if you increase the size of the container holding the air, the air inside will spread out to occupy the space. Just like how gases escape when you deflate a balloon. They go from an area where there is lots of air tightly packed together to the surroundings where there is a lower concentration of air. If there is access to an area with no air, the particles of air surrounding it want to rush inside to occupy all the free space. An area where there is no air or other particles is called a vacuum. And this is why you can't breathe in the vacuum of space, as there is simply nothing to breathe in. The suction effect is caused by air rushing in to occupy all the free space. The bigger the difference in the amount of air on the inside and the outside, the greater the suction. But once the air spreads out inside the vacuum, it's no longer a vacuum, because now it's no longer empty space. So how do you keep the vacuum sucking, and how do you actually get rid of the air on the inside in the first place? The answer is a fan. I know what you're thinking. Fans blow air, not suck. But we don't need the fan to suck. We just need it to get rid of the air on the inside. So if we turn the fan around and blow the air out of the container through the exhaust, What's left is an area free of air. Now the air from the outside rushes in to occupy all the new space. The fan will eventually blow out this air to make more free space. This process keeps repeating itself to create a constant suction effect. This explains how we can get a constant stream of air into the vacuum, but what about the dirt? The dirt is carried in via the air stream. It's picked up and carried due to the friction between the air particles and the dirt. The air particles in the flow keep bumping into the dirt until it's dislodged. Then it's lifted into the air which is all moving towards the vacuum. To increase the ability to agitate dirt on rougher surfaces like carpets, the head of the brush attachment can also have bristles and rollers which spin to agitate and lift up the dirt. The next steps on the journey for the dirt and air is through the piping of the vacuum and then into a bag which acts like a filter. Not that kind of filter. The material of the bag has small holes, big enough for air to pass through but too small for most pieces of dirt. This collects the dirt on the inside of the bag and allows the air to continue on its path out the exhaust freeing up space for more air to come in. Depending on the design the air can also flow through some other filters usually before sensitive components in the motor and another filter on the exhaust called a HEPA filter, which is certified to remove allergens like dead skin and microscopic bugs called dust mites. HEPA filters prevent these ultra-small allergens from being blown out the exhaust into the air. This is really important for people with dust allergies. The bag and filters eventually become full of dirt which can then stop the flow of air as the holes are blocked. As soon as the air stops flowing there is no more suction. The bags and filters have to be emptied out or replaced when they become full or clogged up. This allows the vacuum to keep the suction effect going as the air keeps flowing. It's a terrible feeling when you start your chores and as soon as you turn on the machine you realise the bag is full and needs replacing. Then when you check in the bits and bobs cupboard, you can't find any replacement bags as they've all run out, making a 5 minute vacuuming job stretch into an hour or two while you search for the best place to buy your specific vacuum bag. It always seems to happen at the worst time as well. Well the inventor of bagless vacuums, James Dyson, certainly had enough of this feeling. 
he sought a way to make a vacuum that can keep on sucking for longer without the need to replace bags. The way he achieved this is by harnessing the power of the cyclone. I'm sure when you hear the words hurricane or cyclone, the last thing that comes to your head is a clean and tidy house. But now we'll learn how vacuum cleaners use the seemingly destructive force to filter out dust and debris. The air entering these type of vacuums flows into a cone-like structure called a cyclonic separator. The flow has to curve around and flow into a shape similar to a hurricane. The air and dirt come in together. When they bend around the curves of the cone, they have to change direction quickly. Air is very light so it can spin, twirl and dance around as it wishes. But it's a different story when it comes to the particles of dirt. They can't turn around as quickly as they are. This is due to something called inertia. The larger the mass of an object, the more difficult it is for it to change its course. This is the same reason why you used to get squished by your older siblings when going around bends in the back of a car. If the dirt can't turn around the bend, there's only one place for it to go, which is right into the wall. Once they hit the wall, they slide down to the dust collector bin. The reason for the cone shape is that the air spins faster and faster as you go down the spiral, and they change direction even quicker due to the smaller circle. This causes lighter pieces of dirt to be separated. Once the stream reaches the bottom of the cyclone, pretty much all of the dirt is filtered out. Then all that is left is the clean air, which is pulled up through the middle, which is vacant due to the air flowing around the outside. The air then continues up past the fan where it's blown out through the exhaust so that the process can be repeated. You can arrange multiple cyclones in the vacuum so that the air can be filtered out quickly. This design allows the suction in the vacuum to remain consistent as there's no restriction in the airflow caused by blocked filters and full bags. Now let's look at some of the different types of vacuums. This is an upright. It's probably the most popular and one of the most powerful types of vacuums. They can be used on both hard surfaces and carpets, but they can have difficulties in getting underneath furniture and around tight corners due to their bulky size. However, some do come with detachable hoses to make it easier to get into those nooks and crannies. The main drawback is that they're quite heavy so lifting up and down stairs can be quite a chore. Next is the canister vacuum. They have a tank with a long hose with many attachments making it versatile. Because of the long hose you can use this vacuum to clean up cobwebs and dirt from places that are higher up. However, they can be annoying to drag around behind you in bigger rooms and storing them can be difficult due to their weird shape. Handheld vacuums are small, compact and ultra portable. No cords or long tubes means they can reach where other vacuums can't. They are really useful for cleaning the inside of small spaces such as cars. They are usually very cheap, lightweight and quiet, but they aren't suitable for a whole house due to their small battery and low power. They are more of a replacement for a dustpan and brush. A stick vacuum is what you'd get if an upright and a handheld had a baby. Usually battery powered, they are lightweight and good for getting into the harder to reach areas. They are good for smaller living spaces but again lower power and limited lifetime of batteries can be a deal breaker for larger house owners. However, advancements in batteries have made them more attractive. Robotic vacuums are the weird one of the bunch. They are the newest type of vacuum, offering the unique ability to vacuum floor spaces without the need for a user, allowing for lazy people like me to sit back and relax while the house gets clean. They are good for getting underneath some types of furniture and can even clean the house when you are at home. However, they do have some big limitations. Obstacles such as closed doors and stairs will stop them in their tracks. And there is a possibility of creating a bigger mess if they come across a present left by your pets. They're usually expensive and don't offer the precision of other models. Centralized vacuum systems are one of the rarest types. It's where pipework is placed all around the house and the actual vacuum is placed in a garage or a cellar. They function in the same way as we discussed earlier, just on a much bigger scale. There's outlets spread around the house so all you need to do is plug in a pipe and start cleaning. The biggest benefit is that they take all the dirt and air away to one location and they pump the exhaust outside the house. So there's no chance of particles of dirt being spat out into your living spaces, which is incredibly useful for those who have allergies. 
The mortars have more than double the power of other vacuums and there's no need to carry around a heavy machine everywhere you go. However, they are very expensive and complicated to set up. Vacuum cleaners can also come in various other shapes and sizes. Now let's look at the history of vacuums. For thousands of years, brooms in their different forms were the only way to sweep up dust. Everyone who's ever had to brush up the floors in their house knows it can be tedious and tiring. So who do we have to thank for saving us from sweeping every day? It starts with Daniel Hess from Iowa. Everything changed in 1860 where he submitted a patent for a machine which worked by capturing dirt via a draft of air. You're right in thinking it sounds more like a leaf blower than a vacuum of today. But his contribution wasn't actually creating something that worked as there was no records of it ever actually being made. But what he did was plant the seeds for an idea that brooms were not the final form of sweeping dust. There were a variety of designs working on similar concepts of blowing dust. Notably, Ives McGavy submitted his design in 1869 for Whirlwind, a hand-powered upright machine which bears a striking resemblance to the vacuums of today. Later designs included gasoline-powered systems, but they all failed to become widely adopted. During a demonstration of a similar blowing machine, an engineer from England called Herbert Booth asked why the machines weren't made to suck. He was shouted at and told no machine could provide suction. He sought to do what nobody else could, and he managed to do it with a machine called a Puffing Billy. It was a huge gasoline-powered machine requiring a horse-drawn carriage for it to be moved around. But it worked, and it worked well. He started offering home service calls and was even contracted to clean out London's Crystal Palace after an outbreak of spotted fever. Many corporations and engineers attempted to shrink down the design so that it could be more suitable for home use. Many tried and many failed. The innovation actually came from an unlikely source, a 60-year-old janitor called James Sprangler from Ohio. He sought to find a cheap solution to his problem. He suffered from asthma so his job of sweeping up the store was very painful. He bodged together various bits and pieces to make his design. He started with a broom, a pillowcase as a dust collector, an electric motor from a sewing machine which was connected to a fan and a rotating brush. To his amazement the machine actually worked and he set out to optimise his design. He submitted a pattern and started selling the machines. They proved to be very popular, however this is where he hit a bump in the road. He didn't have the funds to set up the factory to mass produce the machine. This is where his cousin Susan Hoover steps in. Her husband was a successful businessman who saw the potential after hearing his wife praise the machine. He formed a partnership with Sprangler to mass produce the machine. His genius marketing strategy of going door to door to demonstrate the machine allowed the Hoover company to become one of the most famous brands of vacuum cleaner even to this day. These vacuums had small improvements but the general design stayed the same. Like we discussed earlier, there were some major drawbacks. Notably the need to replace the bags once they become clogged up. To solve this problem, James Dyson came up with the cyclonic vacuum cleaner which we discussed earlier. But how did he come up with his design? He actually witnessed a giant version of the cyclone technology in a sawmill in something called a cyclonic separator, where vast quantities of air and sawdust were separated. His eureka moment came when he realised he could shrink the design and fit it inside a household vacuum. After setting up his own company and making over 5,000 prototypes in the early 1980s, he finally came up with the suitable design. However, he faced the same problem as Sprangler, where he had a revolutionary design but not enough money to set up a factory for mass production so he set out to license the design to other companies. When he approached established players like the aforementioned Hoover company, he was overwhelmingly turned down, as they realised it was a threat to their business model of making money from the sale of vacuum bags. He eventually was successful in licensing the product to a Japanese company and he used the funds to set up his factories, where after some bumps along the road, Dyson eventually became the successful business we see today. The Dyson company is responsible for many new innovations, some successful and some not so successful like the Dyson washing machine. If you want to know more about how washing machines work, please watch my previous video. If you've watched this far, you must have enjoyed the video, so why don't you check out my other videos and please remember to subscribe. Who will be the next character in the tale of vacuum development? Maybe it will be you.
Put your ideas on how to improve vacuums in the comments below.